Hi folks, my name is Bill Baker and I work for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife as a district fish biologist covering Ferry, Stevens, and Ponderay counties. Tonight I'll be talking with you about white sturgeon in Lake Roosevelt and upcoming changes to the sturgeon fishery. I'm going to start by giving you some background information on the population and some of the issues that it faces. Then I'll talk to you about the work that's currently being done to rebuild that population. And finally, I'll wrap up with a summary of the fishery in recent years and where we go from here. So let's begin by talking about the sturgeon population in Lake Roosevelt and extending upstream into British Columbia and Canada, an area referred to as the Transboundary Reach. Sturgeon in the Transboundary Reach have experienced persistent recruitment failure since around the early 1970s. Every year, adult sturgeon spawn and produce eggs and larvae, but they disappear during the larval stage. The result of this, over a roughly 50-year period, is that we have an aging adult population with very few young fish filling in behind. Here's an example of what the population looked like in the late 1990s, and you can see that there were very few younger fish. Now, because of this, sturgeon were close to harvest in the U.S. in Lake Roosevelt in 1995. This was followed by closure of the fishery, even to catch and release in 2002. In Canada, the situation has been even worse. White sturgeon were listed under the Species at Risk Act, or SARA, in August 2006. That's the Canadian equivalent of the Endangered Species Act here in the U.S. In 2001, the Canadians began use of conservation aquaculture, or hatchery rearing, as a stopgap measure to prevent extirpation of the population. The goals were to maintain genetic diversity and to rebuild the demographics, that is, the size and age structure of the population. On the U.S. side, WDFW and the Spokane and Colville tribes began a similar program in 2004, initially with fish provided by BC, then with our own fish starting in 2006. Both programs relied on capture of adult brood stock, which were brought back to the hatchery and spawned. Progeny were reared in the hatchery and released the following year. In 2011, the U.S. program transitioned to capture and rearing of wild-caught larvae, which was advantageous for a couple of reasons. Those larvae that were caught in the wild represented better genetic diversity and a far greater number of parents. In addition, broodstock collection, which is labor-intensive and hard on adult fish, was no longer necessary. So this next slide shows how wild-caught larvae are collected. This work is conducted by the Spokane and Colville tribes. Then they bring the larvae back to the WDFW Sherman Creek Fish Hatchery for rearing. They use large D-ring drift nets fish near the bottom. Larval sturgeon hide during the day, but drift with the current to disperse at night and are captured in the nets, which also catch a lot of other debris. The larvae are sorted out and placed in containers, then transported back to the hatchery. This slide shows the number of sturgeon released from hatcheries in Canada and the U.S. since the programs began. On the x-axis is the brood year or year class. That's the year that the fish were produced. On the y-axis is the number of fish released. In the legend, you can see we have fish originating from both Canada and the U.S. DGT means direct gamete take. That is, fish produced from eggs and milt obtained from adult brood stock, which were captured and brought back to the hatchery for spawning. The others, the Canadian wild and U.S. WCL, refer to wild-caught eggs and larvae used in later years. I'll talk more about those later. You can see that in the early years, the Canadians released a lot of direct gamete take fish, shown here by the blue bars. Here on the U.S. side, shown in gray, our stocking program consisted of about 4,000 fish annually through 2010. And, as I mentioned earlier, these fish represented a very limited number of parents. They also experienced far higher survival than anticipated, something like 86% for the first year, then about 98% each year thereafter. Because of that high survival, many of the hatchery direct gamete take year classes were more abundant than the entire adult population. And because of their limited genetics, we realized that as these fish aged toward maturity, they represented a genetic risk to the wild population, something we refer to as genetic swamping. 
To avoid that occurring, we reopened the Lake Roosevelt sturgeon fishery in 2017 and focused harvest on those year classes of fish. And the fishery was very well attended. People came out of the woodwork to fish that first year and a lot of fish were harvested, which was good since that was the goal. This is a graph showing estimated sturgeon harvest in Lake Roosevelt from 2017 through 2021 using two methods, catch record cards in blue and the Lake Roosevelt Creel Survey in gray. The year is shown on the x-axis and the number of fish harvested for that year is on the y-axis. In 2017, we estimate that somewhere around 2,500 to 3,500 or so sturgeon were harvested. And at that point, we knew that we had sufficient fishing power to reduce those overrepresented fish. So the following year, we tightened the slot limit to 53 to 63 inches in order to focus harvest on those fish which were closest to sexual maturity and therefore represented the greatest immediate genetic risk. We maintained that for a couple of years and saw a modest harvest of 250 to 500 or so sturgeon in 2018 and 2019. In 2020, we loosened the slot just a bit to 50 to 63 inches, and we've maintained that through 2022. In those years, we've seen similar effort in harvest. To date, there have been approximately four to 5,000 sturgeon harvested in the recreational fishery in Lake Roosevelt, which has resulted in a substantial reduction over represented year classes and family equalization. This graph is from a report put together by our Canadian counterparts, which reached that conclusion. I won't go into the details of it, except to say that the broad scale conclusion was that the risk of genetic swamping was avoided. So kudos to our angling base, which solved what could have been a major problem. So I'd like to come back to this graph for a moment, which shows the number of sturgeon released from the conservation aquaculture programs over time. But now let's focus on the right-hand portion of the graph where you start to see the gold bars. These represent wild-caught larvae. As I mentioned earlier, the U.S. program transitioned wild-caught larvae in 2011 after we reared and released a small pilot group in 2010. But we had some initial growing pains. Remember, these are wild fish which had to be trained onto hatchery feed. And for the first few years of releases, we did not have sufficient hatchery infrastructure to rear these fish to the same size at release as the previous direct gamete tape fish. You'll recall that size at release is a key factor in survival. Generally speaking, the larger, the better. For year classes produced between 2011 and 2016, fish were generally smaller in number and size at release, which translated into poor survival. Thus, we have approximately six year classes of concern for which there are a limited number of individuals. Now, by the 2017 year class, we largely had the collection and infrastructure challenges figured out. And from that point forward, the program has been pretty stable. And because every sturgeon stocked has a pit tag, we can identify individuals that are caught once they're in Lake Roosevelt, either in the fishery or in stock assessment sampling. So we have a really good idea of length at age, which is shown in this graph, with age here on the x-axis and fork length of the fish here on the y-axis. Now, as you'll recall, the harvest slot for the last couple of years has been 50 to 63 inches. The direct gamete take fish generally began recruiting into the bottom end of that slot at around eight to nine years of age. For the first few year classes of wild-caught larvae, their growth lagged just a bit, likely due to a, a slow start because of the small size at release. But for later year classes, growth seems to be tracking similarly to the direct gamete take fish. And as of last year, we had eight-year-old wild-caught larvae that were nearly 50 inches. I'll come back to this shortly, but the bottom line is that it is now time to move the bottom end of the slot in order to offer some protection for these weaker year classes. Okay, next up here, we'll shift gears and talk a little bit about the wild adult population. This graph shows projected abundance of wild adult sturgeon through 2032 based on survival estimates from stock assessment. On the x-axis is the year and on the y-axis is the number of adults. As you can see here, we have more adult sturgeon in Lake Roosevelt than in the Canadian reach, but the mortality rate is higher, 
And at the current rate, we anticipate that we'll have fewer than 500 adults left by 2027. One of the concerns is that non-harvest fishery impacts, for example, hooking mortality, may play a role in speeding up this decline, and we want to maintain this original wild adult stock as long as we can. This is a graph showing the average water temperature in the upper portion of Lake Roosevelt for the past 10 years. On the x-axis is the date, and on the y-axis is temperature. You can see that over the past few years, the sturgeon fishing season has occurred during the summer and early fall when water temperatures are at their peak, generally something over 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And because sturgeon are cold-blooded animals, there's a strong relationship between water temperature and handling stress. So when fish are caught, the incidence of mortality is higher when water temperatures are elevated. Water temperatures in Lake Roosevelt begin to drop around mid-September. And they continue to decline throughout the fall and winter months. A sturgeon fishery during this period represents less risk to the wild adult population. Okay, so let's take a minute to recap what we've discussed. The Conservation Aquaculture Program has been extremely successful at maintaining the white sturgeon population in Lake Roosevelt and the upper Columbia River. We had a problem with overrepresented year classes of direct gamete take fish in the population. But that problem was solved by anglers and genetic swamping was avoided. Currently, we have some weaker year classes of wild caught larvae that are beginning to enter the lower end of the 50 to 63 inch slot, which has been in place the last couple of years. We also have declining abundance of wild adult sturgeon occurring more rapidly in the US and non-harvest related impacts from the fishery, like hooking mortality, could be contributing. So what will the Lake Roosevelt sturgeon fishery look like for the next few years? Well, we'll be implementing some conservation measures to protect the early year classes of wild caught larvae and wild adults, including a shortened fishing season, moving to a fall fishery to take advantage of cooler water temperatures, which result in less stress on non-harvested fish, and a gradual tightening of the slot limit over the next six years or so, followed by a period of catch and release fishing only. And we'll resume harvest when the 2017 year class is of sufficient size. But we'll have to do that while also limiting impacts to the weaker 2011 to 2016 year classes. So for 2023, the sturgeon season will run from September 16th through November 30th. And the harvest slot will be 53 to 63 inches fork length. Most of the other rules, which have been in place over the past few seasons, will remain the same, including a daily limit of one fish and a two fish annual limit statewide. Anglers must stop fishing for the day after the daily limit is taken and for the season after the annual limit has been taken. Catch record cards will still be required and sturgeon will remain closed to night fishing. Other statewide rules for sturgeon will apply. Because the fishing season does not overlap with spawning, all of Lake Roosevelt, including that portion from China Bend upstream to the Canadian border, will be open to fishing. Next up, this slide shows what the anticipated harvest slot and fishing seasons should look like for the next few years. These scenarios represent our current best guess, but may be subject to modification as additional information becomes available. As a reminder, 2022 was a summer fishery, but that will change to a fall fishery this year, and we intend to maintain a 53 to 63 inch slot for 2023 and 2024. In 2025, we'll likely bump the bottom end of the slot up to 55 inches and maintain that through 2026. Beginning in 2027 and extending through 2028, the bottom end of the slot will likely be bumped upward again, this time to 57 inches. Following that, beginning in 2029, we will enter a period of catch and release only to protect the wild caught larvae year classes of concern, which cannot withstand harvest. We anticipate that we'll be able to provide harvest opportunity again by 2031, but the details of slot limit and fishing season cannot be determined that far in advance. We'll use a combination of stock assessment data and modeling to inform what the fishery will look like as we get a bit closer. Okay, that's all I have. I do want to take a moment and thank our tribal partners, the Spokanes and the Colvilles, and our angling public. 
Without you, the successes we've seen in this program would not have been possible. I also want to acknowledge the Bonneville Power Administration for funding of sturgeon work in Lake Roosevelt. And I want to thank our partners in Canada, the BC Ministry of Forests, Lands, and Natural Resource Operations, BC Hydro, the Freshwater Fisheries Society of BC, and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada for their cooperative efforts and a lot of really great work to support sturgeon in the transboundary reach. We hope that you have found this presentation informative. Thanks very much for your time.